Kitty Feldy, and welcome to this special on the road edition of the Book Club of the Year for Young Adults. We are out here at UCLA for the LA Times Festival of Books, and we're doing that every year. We try to choose one of the books that the LA Times has nominated for a book prize as the book that we will talk about. And the book we have chosen this year is Margot Lanigan's collection of short stories called Black Juice. And my group, and we'll keep our fingers crossed because there's always a chance that the writer is with us and maybe they will join us later in the program so stay with us for that but our group today is a trio of uh, young readers who have been reading together for a long time with a mother-daughter group called the mad readers here with us is sierra senzaki she's in the ninth grade at pasadena high hi sierra <laughs> and josephine kenny otherwise known as joe she's in the eighth grade at uh, john marshall hello and katie fleeman she's a ninth grader at carver city high school Hi, Katie. Hi. Cool. Why don't we start with the first one in the book? It's called Singing My Sister Down. Joe, that was one of your favorites. Uh, yes, this one was my favorite. In Singing My Sister Down, the main character, Dash's sister, has committed murder. And in their tribe, they have a punishment where the... Uh, <laughs> the criminal, or Icky, which is the sister's name, is going to have to sink into their tar pits until she's completely covered. And it's basically a big party on Icky's last day before she sinks. And you know, when you read this, did you immediately think of our tar pits? When I first read it, I kind of imagined it was in Europe and there were all these peat bogs because I had known that they used to do that. In Kind of a, you know, catch your attention way to start a collection of short, short stories. What'd you think, Katie? Um, at first, I didn't entirely get it. I had to read it twice because lots of these books, it's they just they tell you what's happening as it's happening. So the backstory that you you need to know to fully get it isn't explained until the end, really. But once you get through it, then you really understand it. It's really cool. Well, did you like that? I I kind of felt like I was a detective in some ways reading these stories, that I had to do a lot more work to figure out what was going on, but it was very satisfying for me as a reader. But what about you? Um, I just liked trying to figure out what was happening and just trying to, it's like there's a lot of holes in all of the stories and you're just trying to figure out how to fill them in. Lots of them you have to fill in yourself and you're just trying to piece together this puzzle of what happened already. So what did you think of this first story? Um, I thought it was kind of interesting, but I, I was kind of confused as to what time period it might be taking place in because they mention modern technology like trucks and guns and stuff, and yet it's sort of a primitive way of execution to have someone sink down in a tar pit. But I thought it was kind of interesting that you're not quite sure where you are. Katie? Uh, the one thing that I had a problem with it was, was there wasn't a definite plot, like a definite story. I mean, it's just, it was kind of like they accepted that she was going to die and they weren't trying to rebel against it or anything. And I think that's just mostly what the story is, is that it's just telling about what's going on and it's not meant to have a forward moving plot or anything. Well, and I'm wondering if that's the difference between short stories and novels. Um. I think that a short story can have a plot. There's actually another one in here that does have a more forward-moving plot, but it's just it just depends on how you write it because you can have a plot that can be in one paragraph, really, so that doesn't make any difference. Joe? Oh, um, did you feel the lack of plot? Did that bother you since you chose this story? Well, no, because most of the story you're trying to figure out what's happening anyways, so it would be kind of confusing if you were following something and trying to uh, pick up the backstory behind it anyways. So it was kind of interesting just to be reading for the context, not really what's happening next. Well, let's move on to a different one, a very different one, shall we? Um, why don't we talk about Yowlin <laughs> or Yowlinin, Sierra? Um, okay. Explain what Yowlinin is. Uh, in this story, there's a small town, and it occasionally is attacked by these sort of plant monsters called Yowlinins, and they just pop out of the ground with pretty much no warning and eat the people in that town. And so in this story, um, the main character is an orphan girl whose parents were killed by Alanins um, when she was very young. And so the town kind of shuns her, but when the Alanins turn up again, she um, 
is able to um, attack them and save uh, this one boy that she has a crush on. <laughs> well, there's another cheerful little story. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you like this one, Sierra? Um, I kind of like the action, because after a lot of these stories are more, I think, about just sort of glimpsing into this world that she's created, and this one actually had more of a, an action and plot to it, and I just thought that was a little different from the other stories in this book. It's the second time we've talked about this hunger we seem to have as readers for plot. Are you, you know, is there, is there something that's not satisfied when it's not there for you? Um, I guess it's just that you're more used to um, books with more plots and more action, but it is nice every once in a while to see a story where it's just sort of, you're just sort of um, being enveloped in the setting. Who else? Uh, what, okay, Katie. Uh, on that, um, it's just people expect there to be a definite plot with everything. Just, you know, in school you're taught, okay, you're going to have the rising action, the climax, and the falling action. So that's kind of what you expect. I know for me, sometimes I'll write a story and I'll give it to my friend and they'll be like, okay, you have cool characters, you have good dialogue, but there's no story, so it's really boring. I, I don't feel like it's boring. Like, this was done well, so it's not boring, but it's just something that you expect. You're taught that you're supposed to expect there to be a story. Well, you know, that gets back to that classic Greek structure that you talk about, you know, the rising action and the climax and the denouement. We're just sort of used to seeing things like that. And if you go see a movie, you can't go see a movie, at least one that's made in Hollywood that doesn't have, you know, blatantly act one, act two, act three, and things are happening all the time. It's a different kind of pace that's with this. Um, have you ever written anything yourself that as you said, you said you wrote something and gave it to friends and they thought, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Joe, have you written anything yourself that doesn't blatantly scream, I have a plot in here? Um, not really written down, but I've definitely imagined things like that. And I know Katie had a problem with this story at the beginning where she couldn't really de envelop herself. She wasn't really connecting with it. Oh, sorry. She wasn't really connecting with it and she kind of felt left out, Katie did. Okay, well, what <laughs> did you change, or what happened, Katie? I don't know. At first, I just I felt like I couldn't really connect with any of the characters because I didn't know what was happening. And I have this whole thing where it's like you have to feel, you have to be able to em sympathize. Yeah, emphasize. Yeah, sympathize. I'm looking for empathy. Empath I forgot empathize. what the empathize. Okay, yeah. empathize. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it's hard with braces to yeah. talk. <laughs> it is very hard with braces to talk. Um, so it's just because I didn't know, I didn't know anything. I didn't know if I should feel sorry for her or if I should be on the other side. But then when you read it a second time, you realize that's kind of the whole point of the story is that you have to decide while you're reading it what it is. All right, well, let's go on to a different one. Uh, let's see, Katie, you want to talk about House of the Many? Sure. Um, the House of the Many, at the beginning, it starts off in this village, and it's even a little bit cult-like. It's run by this man called the Bard, and their main life revolves around this thing called the House of Three that produces three different kinds of music. It's, here, I wrote it down. We have it written down. <laughs> Cheat sheets. They brought yes. cheat sheets, may I point out, which they let me have, too. There's, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce these correctly, but Anna, which is the woman's um, song, Robra, which is the father's, and then Vil Rotten. I know I just said that incorrectly, but that's basically like the child. That's just kind of like all the noise, the noise that you hear around. And that's basically what their life revolves around. And the main character's name is Dot, and he's getting right to this age where he goes from being a child to kind of like a, an adult. And he goes to this thing, all the men, they kind of congregate in this tent and they talk about wisdom of the world while all the women are out in the gardens making food and basically supporting everybody. <laughs> Gee, do you think a woman wrote this short story? Mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> and so basically he goes to this whole congregation and then he finds out just something isn't clicking with him. And so he just kind of on impulse that night, he just runs away and he goes into the real world and he discovers that it's completely different. He's lived this whole sheltered life and he just, it's about that. And then several years later, he comes back with one of his new friends and he brings back this thing he calls the House of the Many, which is actually an accordion. 
which is what the house of three was. It was an accordion. It was just a broken accordion, and the top of many is a new accordion. And he finds out that the town is just completely broken down. The bard, after he ran away, after Dart ran away, he just kind of gave up, and all the men left, and it's just kind of all broken down. And then at the end, he takes his mother away. Now, why did you like this story particularly? What was it about it that appealed to you? I don't know. It's just, I think, first of all, that cults are kind of, they're really scary, but they're fascinating when you think about it a little bit. And it was just kind of interesting reading about that. Like, and if you compare it to, like, you hear all these other stories, and, like, you'll read a magazine, you'll read it in the newspaper about somebody who's like, I was part of this cult, and then I got away. And it's just kind of being able to relate it to that. And also, it was the longest story, so I felt like <laughs> there was the most development with the characters and everything. Well, are you one of those that really would prefer a novel to a short story if given the choice? Um, I don't know. They're, they're completely different, so you can't really compare them as much because you've got the whole length, like, restriction with a short story. It's just they're completely different genres, so you can have a good short story and that can be better than a bad novel. You can have a good novel that's better than a bad short story, so... I have to confess, I'm, I'm real prejudiced, because I, I don't like short stories. I don't hate them. I hate poetry, but I don't hate short stories. <laughs> I don't know why. It's a bad habit I have. But I love novels. I love story. But so, And I chose this book because I loved these stories, because they were so unusual. You know, this, it overcame my own prejudice against short stories. So I, I was wondering if that was what you were trying to express. Not really. I like reading short stories. They're kind of, it's like, it's hard to explain. It's like a novel you can read over a long period of time, but then you've got a short story, and it's, it's just as good. It's not like there's anything bad with it. It's just shorter. Katie talked about this community being a cult. I didn't quite see it that way. What did, what did you think, Joe? Um, well, we all kind of got together and discussed it, and we all kind of did feel that it was like a cult. It was a group that they were all following this band's orders, and they never really thought the world was any different. And you, you agreed then, Sierra? Yeah, because, I mean, this community where he's brought up, they're very isolated from everywhere else, and you know, they sort of uh, worship this one man, and it's a very different type of society, um, like a cult would be. Um, could I add on? Yeah, to that? go, Katie. Um, I mean, if you just look at it, it's got this structure where they've got their one charismatic leader who's keeping them away from everything else, telling them everything else is bad. He's the one who's actually reaping all the benefits. If you look at it, he's got like 20 wives or something, and then all these slave men doing just whatever he says. He's got a million children who all just worship the ground he walks upon. And then it just, if you read it, it just, it has, I don't know, when I just read it, I just started screaming, cult, 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 in my <laughs> brain. I kept thinking it was just a very isolated society, you know, like in some mountain pass someplace where they just sort of got very insular and isolated from the outside world. And the one thing that you could tell is that um, they were talking about, the mother was talking about how she first met the bard, which was right after Dot's father died. And he was just, she was just saying that with every other woman in this tribe, it was a love story. So it seems like it came out like the bard would just go out and woo some woman to pull them into this group of theirs. And then she knew that it was just like this was a business arrangement type thing. So it just seems like he would just go actively out and try to bring people into his little circle. So it wasn't just people who would just randomly wander in or they'd been here their whole lives. It was just something he'd actually go out and pull people into. If you've just stopped by or you've just tuned in, this is the Book Club of the Year for Young Adults. I'm Kitty Feldy, and I'm speaking with a trio of readers. They are from the uh, Mother-Daughter Book Club, otherwise known as MAD, the MAD Readers, M-A-D. Um, and we are talking about one of the nominees for the LA Times Book Prize this year. It's called Black Juice, and it's by Margo Lanigan. Um, now, Margo Lanigan is from a different country from ours. Could you tell that from the writing, uh, Joe? Well, we kind of cheated. We went online after reading the first story because it was so different, the setting, even if it was set in the past. And we found out she was from Australia. And after that, it kind of made a lot more sense. You could kind of relate everything <laughs> to an Australian setting. and. 
I don't know. I don't know, though. For the stories we've been talking about with, you know, these insects that rise from the ground and cults and <laughs> putting people to death in tar pits, I, generally when I think of Australia, that's not the first thing that comes to mind. Well, a lot of it is fantasy, but certain things were like, if you're talking about the names and the settings of the first one, for example, it's like saying there's tar, there's animals, there's water, there's definitely crabs and things because they eat that as a sweet meat. And I just thought that knowing that she was from Australia, it was a lot easier to connect with the stories. Um, Katie. I don't know. Also, I think it's in the story Perpetual Light, they refer to Aborigine in it, too. And if you think about it, Australia, I don't know that much about the country itself, but if you, it's just it's a bunch of different cultures because it used to be a settlement. So you've got that influence there and then the native influences there. So it just kind of makes more sense. Then if it was like in England, it was written by somebody who was English, you don't quite get that there too. Well, yeah. and Sierra, did, could, could an American have written this collection of short stories? Um, I'm sure anyone with enough imagination probably could, but... Um, Let me just explain. The reason I ask that is, it seems to me this is so not influenced by popular culture, these, yes. these stories. It's, it's just very... Yeah different, not anywhere near anything else you, you read usually. It's, I don't know, <laughs> really, really, really unique. Oh, Katie? One thing I wanted to mention is you said about the pop culture. I believe it was Perpetual Light. They refer to, that she's looking through a magazine, and they refer to like the anorexia column or something like that. <laughs> I just, I caught that. I was like, so, <laughs> yeah. There was a nod. I there, forgot where there's I one story in here that I wouldn't say it's my favorite, but it certainly caught my attention. Um, Red Nose Day, uh, the which line. is kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like Columbine goes to clown college. <laughs> it's the best way to, I would describe it. I mean, it's, it's a really alarming story, and I, I read it twice, too, thinking, is this what it's about, what I think it's about? Mm -hmm. What'd you think? Um, I thought it was very frightening, especially when you finish and you look back, you can realize that these are jealous people killing each other with no real reason. It was very frightening. Was, uh, Sierra? Well, you, you sort of, you start reading it and you don't know what, what's going on. Why are these two guys holed up in like an attic somewhere killing clowns? And it's, um, as you read it later, you kind of get the feeling that the main character went through some sort of emotional trauma about clowns um, when he was little, and that's probably why he's going on this clown killing spree. But it, and the way it, the way I read it, it sounds like clowns are sort of a very huge part of the society, and they're also a very hated part of the society. So a lot of people try and murder clowns. And I have to admit, I hate clowns too. I wouldn't murder any, but. I had a little bit of empathy with that part of the story. And I kept wondering two things. I thought, was this a commentary on school shootings, or is this sort of the writer trying to get out of her system, the fact that she also hates clowns? Um, we were actually discussing this and putting out different like scenarios of how this happened. Some of them, like, um, and we also did some looking online at some reviews. Don't ever apologize yeah. for doing extra um, research. There's always extra points for extra yeah. research here. So, I mean, they talk about when um, the child, the main character, was at an orphanage and about how these clowns would come and pick the kids from the orphanage and how after that the kids would always kill themselves. So we were just kind of like throwing out maybe they were like abusing the, ch the kids or molesting the kids or something and that's why he has this hatred for clowns. And the other thing we found out was some people, and we kind of agreed with this too, was that the clowns were like the elite, kind of like these were people who would dress up and this was their fun, it was like a Mardi Gras type thing, is they all dress up like a clowns, things like that. Yeah, and I also wondered if maybe it was a commentary on the church abuse scandals. That was my other thought, was maybe that was part of it. I don't know. You know, again, it's, there's so much that I want to find out the answers to, but you know what? Let's find out if maybe we can ask the questions of the writer. Is Margo Lanigan in the house today? Yay! Let's bring her up, ladies and gentlemen. Margo Lanigan, nominated for the LA Times Book Prize for her collection of short stories here. It's going to take her a while to get up here, called Black Juice. While she's coming up, let me tell you that if you can't be with us here today at the Festival of Books, we are at the downtown L.A. Library, the Richard Reardon Library, the first Wednesday of every month at 4 o'clock is when we tape. 
and you can come down and watch us do the, the television taping. And if you'd like to be on television, it's so easy. All you have to do is send us an email to bookcluboftheair at yahoo.com. That's spell it out, bookcluboftheair at yahoo.com. We'll get in touch with you and your teacher, and we will get you free books, and we will put you on television. Margo Lanigan, what a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to ask you to scoot really close to that microphone, though, because... Okay, no, can you hear me now? Much yes, better. better. <laughs> well, <laughs> this has been fascinating, I've got to tell you. <laughs> How much did we get right? You got a lot right, yeah. You did, I thought you did very well. <laughs> Because I do, I do like to read the kind of story where I'm only picking up clues as I'm going along. So um, that's the kind of story that I like to um, to write as well. So. Yeah. It, was this intended for a young adult audience when you um, were starting to write the, this collection? Not particularly. Um, I had written for young adults before. I had a couple of mainstream young adult novels out. Um, and I had a collection of short stories where I had specifically been writing for young adults. And so I think um, I, when, when I had written these, my publisher decided, well, we'll, we'll use the, the readership that you have. Uh, but when I was writing them, I was really writing them for myself. I didn't have much of a thought of, yeah. So they were, they were stories that came from pretty deep down, I think. So, so really, I suppose they were written for me, possibly with an idea of myself as when I was younger, but um, but basically they, were, they weren't written with an eye on the audience at all, they were just things that came from down deep. Yeah. Katie, you're like bursting at the seams oh. to ask a question. Right. Oh. <laughs> um, I was wondering, we were reading through it and we discovered like a lot of the times the mother in the story was a really powerful character, mm -hmm. like either for the better or for the worse in all the stories. So. I was just wondering, and also there was a lot of things about children in it, like the children growing up or being a powerful part of it. Mm -hmm. Was that anything from your childhood that affected this? Um, I have I have very strong memories of my own childhood, um, and I discovered as I've grown up that a lot of people don't. A lot of people just sort of move out of their childhood, and then that's kind of gone. That's gone. It's made them what they are, but they don't actually have very clear impressions of what it was like back then. I've got very, very strong memories of what it was like to be a kid and be um, in a society that's sometimes encouraging of kids, but as often as not, you know, just rather dismissive and put them over there in that box and, and you know, keep them safe, but don't necessarily um, uh, interact with them in a very... Um, productive way, and, uh, and oftentimes in, in these stories, particularly the kids are just, you know, okay, park yourself until you can be useful to us. <laughs> so they're not, they don't, they're not high status people in the society. Um, as for the mother thing, I think becoming a mother made me realise how suddenly you switch from being a visible person to an invisible person when you become a mother. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, work against that a little. I wanted the mothers to be real powerhouses, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because even when the, even when we're invisible, we're there driving a lot of things. <laughs> Sierra. Did you have a question? Um, well, actually, I was wondering, um, a lot of these short stories are so, there's a lot of complexity in them, and they're very interesting, and I was wondering if maybe there's a reason why you chose, if there's a conscience uh, decision to not make them longer and to keep them as a short story. Um, I was writing them at a time when I was working full time and I had a family, so um, I was very strapped for time. They were mostly written, they were mostly drafted uh, on the train to and from work. So this was, I had two 40 minute um, breaks in the day when I could get into these worlds. So I had to be really fast and go straight for the most intense moment. And it also, when you're, when you're writing a story that's interrupted a lot of the time, every time you go back to it, you have to do a little bit of re-downloading it into your brain. So it's if, if it's all broken up like that, it's really hard to keep a novel length thing in your head. You just you just spend so much time downloading that you get really stale on it really fast. So with the first drafts of these, I didn't want to take more than a couple of days to get the whole story out, to nail that, that, that through line. Um, and that meant pretty much 
starting at the moment when the most intense things were about to happen and just moving through to the end and then chopping it off almost as soon as it happened. So they, they definitely start after the story begins and they end just before it ends. <laughs> yeah, there, isn't, there isn't much of a tailing off, there isn't much of an explanation. So I was just going straight for the, uh, for the heart of the story, sitting there for a bit and going on. And I think if you tried to maintain that kind of intensity across a novel, it would be almost unreadable. It would have to be written in a completely different way because they're meant to just sock you in the jaw. They're just that intense moment. So it's like it's like ten little novel summaries almost in the one book, which is why it's quite hard to read them all one after another. It's just too intense an experience. You really need to have um, a day off, you know. I wouldn't necessarily recommend reading them at bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> but if you leave, say, 24 hours between each one, then they're easy to absorb, easy to get your head around, and um, yeah, the intensities don't get sort of mixed up with each other because it can be like, it can be a bit like hallucinating if you <laughs> if you stick them all together and you know absorb, try to absorb them all at once. Yeah. It's amazing how much they whoa, fall off the chair, how much they do stick with you though. The worlds that you create are that, so yeah. specific. Mm -hmm. You know, I can still see in you know, that mm -hmm. forest in this in the second story. Um, the ride through the forest. I mean, I can still see in my Lord's Man, I can still see that forest in my head. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> Katie, Katie. I had another question. Uh, we didn't really talk about this one, but um, Sweet Pippet, the one is told by elephants. How yes. did oh, you yeah. think of that? And like all these names, we were having fun trying to say them. And mm -hmm. I was just wondering how you came up. Like the names are like Guru. <laughs> How did you think of that? <laughs> there, there's the queen of the elephants and she's got the longest name and her name is Burundun Hurubu. <laughs> And then the person who's telling the story, I can't remember, the elephant who's telling the story, I can't quite remember what its name is, but there's a Gurulumbun, there's a Chlurobnu, there's a Gorubnu, and uh, they're bas the names are basically a play on the fact that elephants have this chamber in their head which where, where infrasound reverberates, and infrasound is too low for humans to hear, and they can, they can send their infrasound messages through the ground to each other, to groups far away, but also when they're in the immediate presence of other elephants, they can talk, they, they sort of reverberate these noises to each other's foreheads and the, the sound comes from elephant to elephant. So I wanted to get that feeling of that sort of booming, really, really deep um, noise um, echoing from, from one elephant to another. And how did you think of the idea of having a story told from the elephant point of view? Did that just kind of come up or...? Well, it started off, I knew all these, th these interesting things about elephants, which I knew would come together with, with you know, for some story, some time. Um, and then I saw a picture of a little mahout, an elephant rider or driver, and he was just dressed up like a little Indian Raja. He had this beautiful costume, this lovely turban with this beautiful plume of feathers, and he, he, but he was just this child. He was just really young. He had this very young face, and he was preoccupied with some, some thought he was having. It was just this beautiful picture, and I thought, he is, he is just a, a gorgeous person to have in the story. Uh, if I'm going to look at him, I have to look at him through the, through the eyes of someone who loves him. And the, person, the people who are going to love him are going to be the elephants, the people in his care. The people around him aren't going to think terribly much of him necessarily, but the elephants are going to have this bond with him. And they're the ones who are going to drive the story. So um, I wanted to be right inside those elephants, looking at that, that beautiful little boy and, and loving him. Yeah. <laughs> what are you working on now, Marco? I've, I'm just completing another collection of short stories. This is going to be called Red Spikes, and it will probably Wait a minute, are you going to do the whole colour palette? Yeah, I the reckon. Theme? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure what I'll do when I get to tertiary colours. They start getting a bit complicated. <laughs> Turquoise this and amethyst that. Is it a novel, short stories? What? Um, it's, ten, it's ten short stories, and I'm also working on a novel, but that's that's still in its formative times. Yeah. Well, it must be... How old are your children? So that you um, 13 and 17, two oh, boys. Oh, so you've got... They're giving you more room to write now. Yes, they are. So that's really good. Yeah. Hmm. No? <laughs> All right. Well, let's do this. Um, let's thank Margo Lanigan very much for being with us today. A great pleasure to have you here. It's with been us a very great program. pleasure to be here. Thank you for having Her me. Her collection of, of stories is called Black Juice, and it is published, she said, looking very quickly to see what happens.
I'm sorry, HarperCollins. Harper there we go. All right. And if you'd like to join us again, first Wednesdays of the month, the Downtown LA Library. If you'd like to be on Book Club of the Year, send us an email to bookcluboftheair at yahoo.com. And hey, you want a free bookmark? Send us an email. We'll send you one. Thanks so much to our mother-daughter book group, the Mad Reader is here today. Sierra Sanzaki, Josephine Kinney, and Katie Fleeman. Thanks, you guys. You were great. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We'll see you again in the next edition of the Book Club of the Year for Young Adults. I'm Kitty Feldy. Thanks.